Professor John Hardy. We just discussed how long we should introduce. Um, the shortest will be just three sentences. <laughs> Let me do the short version first. Formal proposals of the MNOI hypothesis, multiple prize winners, more than a thousand papers that we, uh, not, unless because forced by UCL, we stop counting. So that's the short versions. But for longer versions, so that you can, well, you, you all have all the, the, the introductions from there, but uh, for longer versions, let me do it in Chinese way, in saying that we Chinese have a saying that yok yong xin cho, that is talking something dang sai first before we talking something good. So if you go to John's lectures, you maybe find his lecture may be a little bit jumpy, sketchy, and you may not get, well, it will be unlike some other lecturers that after one hour, you know, you think you know well, everything start from A, B, C, D until Z, but John's lectures won't be like this. But if you go to John's lectures for more than once, you will find that, okay, there seems to be something that linking all of them together, and that is the most important part. And indeed, I encourage UST to invite John, not just give one lecture at a time, but give a few in, of course, space over, say, two weeks or so. Because with that, you will know that the most difficult part is linking everything together. A cross view is the most difficult part most difficult, difficult part. And if you look at his publications, and you know it crossed multiple areas in neurodegenerative disease, not just Alzheimer's disease. And if you look at his prize, then it crossed multiple areas. He got some of the highest prize in the Alzheimer's disease research, some in Parkinson's disease research. He was a decade ago elected to be a fellow of Royal Society of Medicine under the same roof of Isaac Newton and others. So I don't think uh, I need to be talking more, anything more uh, better now. And let's uh, welcome John. So it's really nice to be a visiting fellow here at HKUST. We're planning some really, I think, exciting, uh, exciting work together on genetics and biomarkers and neurodegeneration. I think we're entering a really exciting time. And actually, just coming here to Hong Kong and also to mainland China, I've been inspired by how determined you are as a community to uh, attack the problem of uh, late-onset neurodegenerative diseases. I, I really have been found this an inspiring visit and the last visit also inspiring. And <clears throat> I'm excited that we are going to be helping you set up a lab here working on the genetics, the biomarkers, and the biology of neurodegenerative diseases. I think it's really a great opportunity for us all. So <clears throat> I'm going to talk about um, all, of late, the, the, all of the major late-onset neurodegenerative diseases, mostly about Alzheimer's disease, but I will talk also about uh, Parkinson's disease and the diseases where you just get tau tangle pathology. So I'll talk about those in the last third of my lecture. But really, the overall, the overall theme of what I'm going to say is given in my title. And that is, I think these late onset diseases in general are a, a failure of damage clear up. And in a way, that is really not surprising. You know, those of us who are unfortunately growing old know that our systems start to fail as we get older. Systems that worked well when we were young work less well when we're 64, and that's a revealing statement. Uh, so things which work well when we were young and were good enough when we were young, when we get older, those systems start to fail. And that's, I think, what is happening in late-onset neurodegenerative diseases. These are the diseases I'm going to talk about. Uh, I'm going to talk mainly in, for the much the greater part on Alzheimer's disease, where the primary pathology is the amyloid beta peptide. And I'm going to talk about that and the protein in which it comes from, which is called the APP protein. Then I'm, I'm also going to talk about the tauopathies. These are diseases where you only get tangle pathology, tau pathology, the gene is called MAPT, 
and I'm going to talk about the hereditary ta tangle diseases, which are called frontotemporal dementia with Parkinsonism to chromosome 17, and the sporadic diseases, which are progressive supranuclear palsy and corticobasal degeneration. I'm going to talk about those, and I'm going to talk about Parkinson's disease as well. Parkinson's disease is a little bit more complicated, and I put it in inverted commas, because the pathology is variable. In most cases, the pathology is synuclein pathology, and I'll talk about that. But in some cases, there is no synuclein pathology. And, uh, <coughs> uh, and in those, I think the primary problem is mitophagy. So I think, in a sense, Parkinson's disease covers two main areas. The others, I would say, are single areas. The, as a way of linking this together, I will just say that in all of these diseases, the disease can be caused in a very simple way, and that is by gene duplications. These are rare, but the, we first described synuclein gene duplications in Parkinson's disease. Synuclein is the pathology, Lewy body pathology is synuclein pathology. The French group Campion uh, described Alzheimer families where you had an extra copy of the amyloid gene. And the, the same group re, uh, described families with a, a gene duplication of the tau gene. Now, I think that this, I, I show these three because this is telling you something very interesting. This is telling you that these proteins are close to, if you like, crystallizing out in the brain. They're close to their threshold for deposition. And so that, and I think that is a very simple point, but a very important point because it tells you that they're on a knife edge of solubility. A little bit too much and you're going to start getting the pathology. And that is a unifying theme of what I'm going to say. I'm attacking this problem from a genetics perspective, but actually this paper from Chris Dobson's group uh, reaches rather the same conclusion that I'm going to reach looking from a protein chemistry point of view. In this paper, they make the point that the deposited proteins are all highly expressed and they're all close to their solubility threshold. So they, they don't look at this from a genetic perspective, but they do come to the same overall conclusion that the proteins that are deposited are those which are close to their solubility threshold. Now, I'll start with Alzheimer's disease. This is the pathology of Alzheimer's disease. The amyloid plaques, this is about a tenth of a millimeter across. The amyloid in the blood vessel here, the congophilic an angiopathy, and then here in the cortex, these are tangles made up of the tau protein. So this is the pathology. What caused this pathology? Well, the first person to suggest that amyloid was where it started was George Glenner with this paper here. He noted that the uh, the amyloid that well it was already known that people with down syndrome got alzheimer's disease they have got three copies of chromosome 21 and he noted that the sequence of the amyloid peptide that he got from down syndrome was the same as the general sequence of amyloid in alzheimer's disease and he said this is the first chemical evidence of a relationship between Down syndrome and Alzheimer's disease. It suggests Al Down syndrome may be a model for Alzheimer's disease. Assuming the amyloid peptide, the name has changed, is a human gene product, it also suggests the genetic defect is on chromosome 21. So he obviously thought that people with Down syndrome got sick simply because they made too much amyloid. He obviously thought that that was the case. As a geneticist, we went in, geneticist, we went into this completely um, uh, in a completely agnostic way. The nice thing about doing genetics is that you don't really have a hypothesis. You just want to find the gene, and then the gene will tell you where it's, it started. And that was what attracted me to doing molecular genetics. 
And this is our paper describing that. And what you're looking at here is the top half of chromosome 21. And here on the top half of chromosome 21, here is all the affected members share the, the entire region, but these two unaffected members have got parts of the chromosome and they are not sick. So the simplest interpretation of this data is that the gene in that gap, which is the amyloid gene, there are about 30 other genes, but the amyloid gene is there, must be the cause of the disease. And when we sequence the amyloid gene, we found the mutation. This is the normal sequence. There's nothing here in the T lane. Here is the mutant sequence. And you can see that that person has got the, a mutation. And this is the mutation. And the thing about this is it was the first mutation which caused, we knew caused the disease. And so that led us to draw the amyloid hypothesis. Now this is the woman from the family. Actually, I'm going to show the video. I don't know if it, the video will play properly uh, with sound, but I think I should show the video. Here is the woman from the family who brought the family to our attention. I'm just going to show the video. I, I didn't tell the audiovisual people that I was going to do this, so it might not work. The quest for medical treatments and cures this isn't is the husband just about of that woman. Slides and microscopes and uh, and what can you do about the symptoms? It's about families. It's about individuals. It's about stories of people who who suddenly begin to lose themselves in a way that's frightening for them and terribly painful for those who love them. A lot of people would say that Alzheimer's disease research, to some extent, started with Carol's family. This is the woman I'm... All of them were between the ages of 54 and 58, and it was at that stage that uh, our life changed really. We put an advert in 1985-1986 in the Alzheimer's Society newsletter because we were interested in studying the genetics of Alzheimer's disease and the very first letter I got was from Carol Jennings and she had uh, drawn her family tree, described her family tree. The breakthrough itself came in 1991. We got a letter uh, in January telling us they had identified a gene that they believed causes Alzheimer's disease. When we found the mutations in amyloid in, in Carol's family, we knew that that is where the disease started. It's been a dominant feature of all work on Alzheimer's disease. Carol's family has what's called autosomal dominant Alzheimer's disease and that means that if your father or mother has the disease you have a 50% chance of inheriting the gene and if you get the gene you're going to get the disease at a very similar age probably to your parent. Now, this is her now. She's exactly my age. She's a shell of the woman she once was. She's um, unfortunately, she carried the but gene. But she's still my wife. And she's now so demented. She's still part it's of her life. She's very, this, was, this video was two years ago. She's now too sick to come to our hospital anymore. She used to come We may not be able to change the cards year. that life deals with us, but we can change the game we play with the cards we've got so that future generations don't have to carry the same pain. This is her son who's now also coming, he's of course in his 30s, he's also coming to our centre now. She was a remarkable, well, I mean, she's a remarkable woman, she's still alive, but very ill. And um, she, after she, um, after, after we sorted her family out and found the mutations, she decided that she was going to help other families and so she became the national volunteer organizer for families with frontotemporal dementia. 
So she did not do anything more with Alzheimer's disease. She didn't, she felt it was too close. So she did uh, the, as a volunteer, she was the national coordinator for all the families in the UK with frontotemporal dementia. And yes, she came to Queen Square for research purposes, but also to help organize meetings for frontotemporal dementia sufferers. And she said, and you might have seen the quote there, that she didn't think it would help her generation, and of course it hasn't helped her generation, but that she hoped it would help her children's generation. And I think that we have to help hope that that is the case too. She's a, a really a remarkable woman. So, so we found uh, mutations in her family. This is her at that time, and there's her son on the right. Uh, and um, families with amyloid mutations are, are quite rare. Uh, we've now got at Queen Square maybe 10 families with amyloid mutations. There were other genes to find, and Peter Hislop found families with, found presenilin 1 and presenilin 2. This is the structure of presenilin 1 here in blue. Uh, he found this in, I think, 1995, and uh, when he found it, we didn't know what its function was, but we now know, because of the work of Dennis Selko, Mike Wolf and Bart de Strooper, that this gene is, encodes the protein which cleaves the amyloid protein. And here you have the amyloid precursor protein in the active site of presenilin gamma secretase. And these turquoise residues here are the uh, aspartic acids which are responsible for the cleavage here. And so this also fits with the idea that amyloid is where it starts because this is the amyloid Meta the APP metabolizing protein. What I've said so far is really ancient history. AP amyloid mutations cause disease. Presenilin mutations also cause disease. They are the enzyme gamma secretase, which cleaves amyloid. And all of these genes are involved in amyloid production. And in many experiments that our lab and many other labs have done, we have all shown that these mutations all alter amyloid processing so that more or a less soluble form of amyloid is produced. And th so these mutations are rare, but they all have the same effect downstream. Amyloid deposition is going to be more likely. Uh, and that's in cells and animals. And this paper here is a paper in people with the mutations showing that what we had shown in animals and cells was also true in individuals with the mutations, this group at Washington University. That's, so as I write at the top, this is ancient history. And this ancient history allowed us to draw this diagram in 1998, uh, which is the amyloid hypothesis. Uh, amyloid precursor protein, amyloid production, the mutations all make this more likely, and then we say this is a downstream effect. The one thing I haven't mentioned at the top here is that we and others showed that tau mutations, I didn't, haven't mentioned this, tau mutations give rise to tangles and cell death. They don't give rise to Alzheimer's disease, so it suggests that they come in here and have that effect. Now this, I still think that this is broadly true, but there's some terrible simplicities in this diagram. The first is that I thought of this diagram when I drew it as being uh, like a, 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 a metabolic pathway, something that was happening over seconds. In fact, we now know that this process takes 20 years. It's not, a, it's not like glycolysis. Glycolysis, you change the glucose concentration and it, it, it happens over seconds. What this is saying is that this is a process which takes many, many, many years. And that, of course, is very different from a, a simple biochemical pathway. And the other thing of simplicity is it implies that amyloid outside a cell, we are implying this is the neuronal membrane, is causing tau dysfunction inside the cell. And uh, I think we now know that that is not the case. This is not just about neurons. It's not just about neurons. For many, many years, maybe for nearly 20 years, nearly all the work on Alzheimer's disease has been on neurons. And 
we now know that that, that um, focus is too, too simple. What has happened in the last few years about doing genetic analysis? Well, a couple of things to start with. The first is, this is the normal pathway of metabolism. This is the pathway which does lead to amyloid production. The enzyme base here, this is presenilin gamma secretase, amyloid production. Cut here, cut here, amyloid. This is, so this is, if you like, the bad pathway. This is the good pathway in cartoon language. C cleavage here by alpha secretase. Cleavage here, again, by presenilin, does not yield amyloid. So that's the, the, good path, the good pathway. What other mutations have found? Well, we and Rudy Tanz's group have found mutations in alpha secretase, which uh, increase your risk. So mutations which inhibit this also lead to increased risk. That, too, is consistent with the amyloid hypothesis. And then this, uh, the Icelandic group did this. They showed that a mutation in amyloid which uh, reduces base cleavage uh, decreases your risk. So if you have a mutation here which inhibits this cleavage, then you have a reduced risk of disease. Also then consistent with uh, the amyloid hypothesis. All good, but what's happened in the real world of clinical trials? And the answer is that this has not just not been useful yet. Gamma secretase inhibition, the patients got worse. The clinical trial was stopped. Beta secretase inhibition, the patients got worse. The clinical trial was stopped. Amyloid immunization, that's a complicated uh, treatment because everybody reacts to immunization in a different way, but that did not work. Antibodies, w engineered antibodies, which reduce soluble amyloid concentration, failed in a phase three trial. And most recently, antibodies which remove plaques also failed in a phase three trial. So, of course, you know, we all went into this saying amyloid is, is how it starts. And yet these processes all, when applied in clinical practice, did not work. And we have to think, why did it not work? I think a major reason, perhaps not the only reason, but a major reason it, they did not work is because the uh, drugs were given too late. I mentioned that this was a 20-year process. These, this is the famous Jack curves. Anybody who goes to an Alzheimer Congress will see this slide twice every session. Everybody shows this. So, uh, and what this is saying is somebody comes in here to the clinic. Let's say a, a wife brings her husband into the clinic here and says, my husband, I think, might be in the early stages of dementia. That means that the husband is going to, might get into a clinical trial around about here. Let's say this is 70. Let's say that the husband might get into a clinical trial at age 72 or something like that. But we now know that if we were looking at amyloid in the brain, that would have started to go up in the early 50s and would have been maxed out by the time the clinical trial. And the drugs, most of the drugs that I've just been mentioning, don't remove amyloid, they stop more deposition. So it's too, those drugs are not going to change the amyloid in the brain because it's already maxed out. And so if you like, it's like taking a statin when you're having a heart attack. It's the right drug, but the wrong time. So that's, that's the point. Having said that, I just mentioned aducanumab does remove plaques. That's the first drug which removes plaques, and that also did not work. And so the explanation I've just given is not the only explanation. But if you think about it, if you remove plaques, you, the hypothesis you're testing is, is the brain from which amyloid has been removed the same as a brain from which amyloid, in which amyloid has never been deposited? Is, are those two things the same? And I, I think that we do not know those two those things are the same. And so I think 
that uh, we have to be cautious how we interpret that data. So I don't want to say that too late is the only explanation, but it is part, I think, of the explanation. We want to be giving drugs, amyloid drugs, somewhere here. We want to be giving anti-amyloid drugs somewhere here. And that's 10 or 15 years before they come to the clinic. And that is a challenge. I'll talk about that later on. Now, everything I've been saying relates to these few cases with amyloid-related mutations. That may be, well, if I said 1% of cases, that would be an exaggeration. It's, it's much less than 1% of cases. What's happening in late-onset disease? Well, this is the, the system that we're now doing, which is genome-wide association studies. I'm going to come back to this a bit later on, but for the point I'm going to make also now is that these have been done in Caucasian populations and they have involved enormous numbers of individuals. And that is very important. You need enormous numbers of individuals to do this. And this is one of the reasons that I'm here and we're working with HCUST. We want to be able to do these types of studies, large-scale studies, in, in Asian populations as well as Caucasian populations. That's one of our joint aims. Anyway, to now talk about the biology, here you have the chromosomes along here. Here's APOE, which was described many years ago, and these are the other genes we're now allowed to declare as Alzheimer genes. And you can see, well, actually, this is a little bit out of date, but we've now identified about 40 other genes which are involved in late-onset disease as risk genes. And the important thing about these genes is that they map to pathways, and that, I think, is crucial into our understanding of what's going on. And the two made, there are others, but the two major pathways are the innate immune system, which in the context of the brain is largely microglia and lipid metabolism. I won't say cholesterol metabolism, I'll say lipid metabolism. Those are the two pathways which turn out to be important in late, in, in late onset disease. And this is just to illustrate that. APOE is obviously lipid metabolism. CLU1 is lipid metabolism. PCAM is this is probably APP processing. Probably. We don't know, but we think that's APP processing. ABCA7 is lipid metabolism. CR1 is the innate immune system. BIN1 is probably, again, APP metabolism. And MS4AE, these were the first ones described, is again microglia. So over and over again, we're seeing the same pathways come up. I'm now going to take a little bit of a diversion. Uh, in the, about 2010, our group decided to start looking for recessive genes for dementias. We, all the genes that have been found until then have been, do, either, have been autosomal dominant. And I thought it was likely there were some recessive genes for dementia. So we went to Turkey to, and had colleagues in Turkey, Ebba Lohman and Murat Emery. And they had identified these three families with uh, a recessive dementia, where the children here in their 30s developed dementia. And so we, we sequenced these families to find the gene. And we found that all three families have mutations in a gene called TREM2, loss of function mutations in a gene called TREM2, Q33X, T66M, and Y38C. These recessive genes, uh, uh, this recessive gene was the cause of this uh, dementia in the Turkish population. And when, when you find a mutation, the first thing you do is say, have I ever seen that mutation before in any other samples that I've sequenced? And so we were, we were looking at our Alzheimer's series, and in fact, we had seen those, all of those mutations before in our Alzheimer's series. In the Turkish families, we'd found them homozygous, but in our Alzheimer's si series, we'd found them heterozygous. T66M 
once in a case, not in a control. Y38C, three times in cases, not in controls. Q33X, twice in cases, not in controls. So we had found these mutations six times in our 1,000 Alzheimer cases and never in our 1,000 controls. So we started to think that this, these mutations predisposed to Alzheimer's disease. And then also in this data set, we saw this mutation, R47H, 22 times in cases, five times in controls. So this tells us that TREM2, when homozygous, gives this recessive dementia, but when heterozygous, increases your risk of getting Alzheimer's disease. And this is our paper top left. Decode in Iceland published a similar finding just on the R47H, top right. But actually, this paper, which came out in 1983, makes the same point. And this paper shows a family with this rare dementia, recessive dementia, that some individuals in that family also have Alzheimer's disease. So this finding is the same finding in 1983, which we were not aware of when we published our papers. So in 1983, Tom Bird had made the same suggestion that, that there was a relationship between this rec rare recessive dementia and Alzheimer's disease. Now, when we did this work, we were, we, so in the, in our, what I've described to you is our genetic findings with respect to TREM2. We were doing, as was Peter Hislop, gene expression studies where we had made Alzheimer amyloid transgenic mice. And we were looking at what genes changed in response to amyloid deposition. And we noted in this paper Consistent with the results described in a previous study, we show that expression of TREM2 rises in parallel with amyloid deposition in transgenic mice. And in fact, remarkably, TREM2 is the gene whose expression changes the most as amyloid is deposited in the brain. So, TREM, so remarkably, we have two entirely different sets of experiments, genetic experiments, gene experiments, experiments, and both of them give rise to, both of them point at TREM2. And uh, so this tells us then that the response to amyloid might be very important. This paper top here from uh, Alison Goat makes some of the same points, uh, and she says that many of the GWAS hits for Alzheimer's disease have their expression driven by a gene called PU.1, which is a microglial transcription factor. This is our paper when we did the gene expression work. And in the next, here is the TREM2 expression, top left here, showing that TREM2 expression rises as the mice get older and amyloid is deposited. And so we look to see which genes had their expression altered in response to amyloid deposition. And that's shown top left here. And he, these are the, this module of genes here are the genes whose expression goes up the most with TREM2. TREM2 is the leader. That's here. There's TREM2. These genes are also going up with response to amyloid deposition. And remarkably, these genes here are, G, are also genetic risk factors for Alzheimer's disease. So this is saying that this module of expression, genetic variability in this module of expression, it, it contributes to disease risk. And so we asked a very simple question, series of questions. Is there an overrepresentation of significant associations with Alzheimer's disease in this module? And the answer to that was yes, with a p-value of 10 to the minus 41. That's including the genes we already know. If we take the genes out that we know about already, the p-value is still 10 to the minus 10. And so which other genes are also associated with disease? And that is shown here. This is that module blown up a little bit. Here's TREM2 again. 
The ones circled here are the ones we knew about already. The ones underlined in blue are the ones we can now say are also associated with Alzheimer's disease. So what this is saying is a very simple thing, and it's given in the title to the paper, Genetic Variability in Response to Amyloid Deposition Influences Your Risk of Getting Disease. It's a very simple outcome. These are the genes we can now declare, and they are all, uh, actually all of them have been discussed by other authors before. OAS1 is involved in cytokine regulation, and therefore the inflammatory response. GLA, GAL3ST4 is used by pathologists sometimes as a microglial stain, and it stains only microglia around plaques. CXCL10 is a pro-inflammatory cytokine. HLA have been reported before by the Finns. LAPTM5 is also found around plaques and have been used by histologists. And ITGAM have been identified by Alison Goat as something whose expression was driven by that microglial transcription factor. So this all points then to, uh, if you like, the microglial response mediated by cytokines to amyloid deposition. So this is what this, uh, the top is what allows, we're allowed to now declare. Genetic variability is a component of Alzheimer risk. And, but the same point has been made by the WashU group, again, in a similar paper to the one I showed you about early onset disease, they said that decreased clearance of amyloid was, uh, was, uh, was associated with late onset Alzheimer's disease. So they showed, if you like, an, an, an analogous finding using data from, from, um, data from patients. Now what I've told you so far, I hope has been facts. I'm now going to tell you what I think this is telling us. And what I think this is telling us that we're seeing microglia and lipid metabolism. How are they linked? And I would say that they're linked because I'm going to suggest that amyloid deposition starts in the lipid environment of the membrane. APOE is, of course, a lipid transporter. ABCA7 is a lipid, is a phospholipid transporter. TREM2, which we've talked about a lot, is a phospholipid receptor. And MS4AE is a fatty acid receptor. So all of these are then involved, I, th I would say, they're microglial genes, but they're all involved in lipid metabolism. And I would say this is what's happening. This is the diagram really I started with, showing alpha secretase and beta secretase. But instead of showing amyloid going off like this into this fluid, I'm, I'm saying that amyloid deposition this is a hydrophobic peptide, might be, st might be starting in the membrane. And the membrane damage is what the microglia are responding to. And while the membrane damage is being adequately responded to, you are amyloid positive, but you're not demented. And it's only when this cleanup system fails that you switch from having amyloid in your brain to being having amyloid in your brain and starting the dementia process. That's what my suggestion is. So in this period here, your cleanup system is responding adequately to amyloid deposition. And it's only when you get here that your cleanup system fails and you start to switch to dementia. Now, can we identify people in that prodromal area? Obviously, we, can, we know about Down syndrome. We know that, that they're going to get disease. We, we can predict who is with amyloid or presenilin mutations is going to get dementia. Can we predict who in the general population will get dementia? And the answer is, in Caucasians, we can. We've made so many findings in Caucasians that we can predict with an, a, a decent R-squared value of about 0.8, 84% here, who in the general Caucasian population is going to get disease. We can't do this 
in the Asian population because we don't know the genetic variability yet to anything like the same degree of accuracy. So this is what I think is the future for Alzheimer's disease. This is the summary then of where I'm up to in Alzheimer's disease. And before I move on to the other diseases, I'm just going to emphasize the last point on this slide, which is to see, say, and going back right to the beginning of my talk and saying that late onset disease, you can see it as a damage response failure and the manifestation of that damage response is the deposition of the protein which is, uses that transmembrane uh, metabolism process and it's the highest expressed and therefore the first to come out of solution. Now I'll go through the other diseases much, much, much more quickly, I promise. I'm not going to keep you here for hours. Uh, and what we're seeing here, when we look at Parkinson's disease, is we see two groups of genes. We see mitophagy genes here. The classic is Parkin, which is Park 2. These are genes involved in mitophagy. And then late onset disease, uh, 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 sorry, we're also seeing... Uh, endosome lysosome system uh, and uh, in the majority of the genes as well, the endosome lysosome. So these are the two pathways which are coming out of our analysis of Parkinson's disease. And uh, this is this next slide, this is online on BioArchive, it's not yet published, but when we look at the GWAS for Parkinson's disease, most of the genes we find in Parkinson's disease are mapped to those sa same pathways either to mitochondrial damage and mitophagy or to the endosome lysosome system. So we see the same, again, those are the two pathways that come out. Now, the classic example of a, a, a lysosome gene has turned out to be GBA, uh, which is when homozygous gives rise to Gaucher's disease, when heterozygous it predisposes to Parkinson's disease. And this is a general association. When we do sequencing of Parkinson's disease cases, we see an excess of lysosome storage disease gene, heterozygous lysosome storage disease genes. So in general, if you have, if you like, weak lysosomes, if you have weak lysosomes, you're more likely to get Parkinson's disease. It's like a, a, a late onset form of a lysosome storage disease. And the interesting thing is that, well, we showed that cynuclein overexpression causes disease, but we now know from this work from Dmitry Krenk that, that cynuclein is metabolized through the lysosome. Cynuclein is metabolized through the lysosome, and if you produce too much cynuclein, you inhibit the lysoso lysosomes. And so this fits with the, the idea that lysosome insufficiency is part of your risk of Parkinson's disease. So, to, to, hi, whoops, to highlight this then, what I'm saying is that uh, just as if you overload the membrane clearance pathway in Alzheimer's disease, you end up with amyloid deposition, if you end up if you, in, if you overload the lysosome system in the brain, you're, you're more likely to get Parkinson's disease. And the way to overload it is produce too much synuclein or to have weak, if you like, lysosomes. So that is the, that's the common factor. And th though we can think of two pathways to Parkinson's disease, both of which end up in the lysosome, there is the, the synuclein pathway here, which goes through uh, the lysosome, or the mitophagy pathway, which I haven't talked about really, which also uh, goes through the, the lysosome to disease. And so it's a, I would say overall, it's a lysosome, pro Parkinson's disease is a lysosome problem. And that is summarized here. Uh, incidentally, I'll leave these slides. If, if people want these slides, of course, I, I'm going to I'll leave them here. So now moving on to the Tangle diseases, this is when we found tau mutations caused the Tangle diseases. And these, when we do the GWAS for Tangle diseases, which we've just started to do, 
we find tau as the top gene, then we find, I don't understand why, this myelin sheath protein, but then the next genes we find are all involved in the ubiquitin proteasome system. And interestingly, tau is metabolized by the ubiquitin proteasome system. So the same overall finding. Too much tau is one way of getting disease. Insufficient tau degradation through a failure in the ubiquitin proteasome increases your risk of getting uh, tangled diseases. So again, the same overall findings that either you get disease by making too much of the protein or you fail to degrade it. And the pathology you see relates to which system is failing. So this is my final slide. In all diseases, genetic overproduction of protein leads to autosomal dominant disease. In all diseases, the other genes, many of the other genes, are involved in the clearance of those proteins. And maybe there's nothing special about these proteins except, as the Cambridge group says, they are those genes which are closest to their critical threshold. So I think that the important thing for the future is to understand these clearance pathways so that we can potentiate these and aid these clearance pathways to reduce the incidence of disease. Thank you very much. Thank you for the great talk, Dr. Thadi. Uh, my question was about the polygenic risk scores. Uh, what stops them, aside from the population issue that you mentioned? So let's say in a Caucasian population, what stops them from being now directly, aggressively being used to identify and treat high-risk individuals? We're just starting to do that. We're just starting to do this. I mean, the paper that you saw was only from, I think, last year, maybe the year, late the year before. We're, ju that it's ju we're just starting to do polygenic risk or analysis in, um, in, in, for, for people in drug trials in, in North America and Europe. We're just starting. When we apply the Caucasian polygenic risk score to Asian populations, yeah, it doesn't work very badly. It works very badly. We need to do the same in Asian populations. And, and I think from your back, I don't know what your background is, we need to do it in many different Asian populations. Yeah, yeah, far away. So, you know, recently this gene, SLC6A4, was reported uh, to be possibly a false candidate that arose from genetic gene function, GWAS studies of smaller sizes, and in really large cohorts, this is in depression, but in re really large cohorts of 600K sample size, it disproved what was thought for the last 10, 20 years to be an important gene for depression. Uh, these reports recently came out, and I was wondering what would be your advice to the field of Alzheimer's? How, what are the checks and balances we could have, short of sequencing 600,000, uh, to avoid these pitfalls? It is difficult. I've oversimplified the GWAS, really, because when you get a GWAS hit, you don't really know which gene close to that hit is the real gene. So there are misleading reports, and it takes a while. I mean, there's no simple answer to your question. It takes a while to, to really understand each hit and understand which gene it is. Obviously, in Parkinson's disease, if you get a GWAS hit, at synuclein, probably it is synuclein and not one of the other genes close to synuclein. It makes sense. But also, I mean, there's a hit at tau in Parkinson's disease. For years, we have thought that hit related to tau. But of course, there's no evidence really of tau pathology in Parkinson's disease, really. And I actually now, in fact, there is a mitophagy gene next door to tau which is in the same haplotype. So I think that we have been saying tau for the last eight years, and I think that we will have been wrong, and I think it's this other gene which is next door. So this is a developing field, and it takes, you have to keep your eye on the literature. And I, what I will say 
is that cell biologists need to be a bit suspicious of geneticists and take their uh, advice with a pinch of salt because, you know, sometimes it's wrong and it takes a while to sort out. So for the uh, polygenic uh, risk score, I just wonder what is the... Uh, is there any development on uh, using it to stratify the patients? Actually, there is. We've just published a paper. It's just online. Uh, so it's, if you just check on, it's uh, freely available online. We had to pay for the open access. So you can even look at it now. We just published. Uh, and actually, the polygenic risk score works in APOE2 individuals, for example. So, yes, it, it, the polygenic risk score works in the context of no E2 or no E4. It still works. It, the paper was online just a month ago. So, uh, I, you mentioned the importance of building the, um, the Asian database, right? Because uh, so far, the information is still quite scanty. Uh, so far, the evidence uh, suggests that the prevalence of trend 2 and APOE4 is lower in, in Chinese population. So how would you interpret that uh, data? And, and do you expect that uh, or, you know, in the Chinese population there will be a different set of genetic variants? Or, or you think uh, yes. E2 or E4 would still be relevant? Oh, uh, yes, E2, and e, uh, of course, APOE, APOE, of course, as you know, is relevant in the Asian population. I think. I know more about Parkinson's disease because there's more work being done in Parkinson's disease. In Parkinson's disease, we find um, the same genes in Asian populations that we do in Caucasian populations, but their order of importance is different. So their order of importance, so for example, one of the genes, I, can't, I think I'm going to say it's RAB7, that, we, that was seen in Asian populations with a population with a, a sample size of 2,000. But in Caucasian populations, we found the same gene, but it took us, I think, 15,000 samples before we saw it. So it's obviously a more important gene in Asian populations. The other thing is that, again, TREM2, R47H is really a Caucasian variant. There are Asian variants. I'm going to say H168Y. I, I might be wrong, but and that is important in Asian populations. So same gene, but different variant. So and this is the sort of thing that I think we'll find. Largely the same genes, certainly the same pathways, often different variants. Thanks. Thank you very much.